much for joining us. I'm admitting everybody in from the waiting room and we're recording. So thank you so much for being here for the third edition of our Calming the Pandemic Mind workshop, Mindfulness Workshop with John Sillam Paris. So as we're just giving a few more minutes for folks to sign in, uh, we'd love to hear from you guys as to anything you're looking forward to this holiday weekend. Do you, does anybody have any plans? We, we were just chatting for a second before we opened up the waiting room saying how the weekends kind of all blend together in this work from home atmosphere. But if anybody has any fun plans they're looking forward to, jump in in the chat and tell us also. There's a lot of familiar faces on today, but tell us um, how you heard about the workshop too and where you're joining from. And I'm gonna turn it over to Katie so she can say hi and read off some responses. Hi everyone, happy Friday. Let's see. Who wants to start? Well, I don't know what I'm doing this weekend, but I'm enjoying a relaxing, hopefully it'll just be relaxing. Oh, Erin, you're going to a drive-in movie tonight? That's awesome. <laughs> Melissa, no plans. It's hot. We finally have some sunshine today, which I'm excited about. Steven from Arlington. Oh, cycling. I need a bike. I need to do that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Hi, Jada. Fairfax, Virginia. Happy it's Friday. Your dad's making ribs on Monday for the holiday. That sounds awesome. Barbecue. I like that in my life. Liz, no plans. Kira, this Sunday I'll be celebrating the Muslim holiday. I don't know how to say that. Kira, can you tell me how to say that? Will you unmute yourself and tell me? It's Eid or Eid. Eid, okay, to include the holy month of Ramadan. Cool, that's awesome. So two holidays in one weekend and then a barbecue the next day. That oh, all wow. sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like that. Uh, Melissa, your husband's smoking a brisket. Guys, you're making me hungry. <laughs> This all sounds great. And Jen, you're going to the beach this weekend? Yeah, we're headed to the beach. It's going to be a live at the beach summer and work from Bethany in Delaware. So excited to get there and get settled again, make up, make a home office there. But so jealous. I'll still be here in St. Louis, Jen. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll still be working. Don't worry. <laughs> Always. Well, John, let's turn it over to John and um, get some intro to what we'll be covering today. Okay. So today we're going to go back a little bit to the CBT part, the cognitive behavioral therapy part to help quiet pandemic mind. Last week we did self-regulation skills, which is much more mindfulness based. So the first week we talked about um, reliance on others for approval. We talked about um, uh, perfectionism and all or, nothing, all or nothing thinking. And then we also talked about excessive need for control. So this week we have a few other, what we call cognitive distortions to pay attention to whenever you're anxious. So whenever you're anxious, that should be your cue, your marker, that maybe just maybe the style of thinking that you're in could be creating more anxiety. So the first one is um, called examining the evidence. So the next time you feel anxious, you want to try to pull back and try to separate what you're thinking about uh, between whether it's a stone cold fact, like is this really something factual or is it my opinion about something? There's a big difference between the two. My opinion and my interpretation of something is very different than an actual fact. So again, we're separating facts from opinions. So for example, um, I'm a failure or I'm never going to succeed in life um, and this COVID pandemic is never going to end. That is much more of an opinion about something. A fact can be more like I forgot to take out the trash. Um, a coworker spoke to me in an angry voice. Those are facts that can affect you and cause you anxiety, but those are different than opinions. So again, we have opinions, 
or we have facts. And ask yourself, is it a stone cold fact or is it an opinion? The second one is called the double standard method. Double standard method is when we hold ourselves to different standards than we do other people, meaning we're probably harder on ourselves than we are with other people. So the next time you're in a cognitive distortion and you're beating yourself up, let's say, um, you may realize that the way you're talking to yourself is probably not some way that you would talk to someone else, especially not a loved one. You'd probably be a lot more compassionate with them. You'd probably be a lot more patient with them. You wouldn't give them such a hard time. So double standarding means I have to be aware that I have to hold everybody to the same standard. So for example, um, if you're usually hard on yourself about up and coming things, you wouldn't say to your, to your friend, you're going to screw this up just like you screw everything else up, or you're such a fool mm -hmm. for making a mistake. You would never tell your friend that. You may tell them something different, but um, it certainly wouldn't be that. So putting the evidence and the double standard method. Um, the next one on there is, I believe, letting go of absolute language. So absolute language is a very good one too, because I assert that the next time you're feeling anxious about something, you may be using um, absolute language. Absolute language is words like never, always, should, and shouldn't. Whenever you use these words, you're probably in some kind of irrational statement in your mind, because never, as we know, is not true. Never is something that you're, you're projecting into the future that hasn't happened yet. And always isn't usually true because there's always some exception to it. But the should and the shouldn't are probably the most, um, the most damaging of all. Should and shouldn't means that there's some ether out there about how to do the world, how to do life. So I tell people, whenever you say to yourself, I should go to the gym more often, or I should be more productive, or I should be eating better, try to change the should to prefer. So I would prefer to go to the gym more often. I would prefer to be eating better. That one gives you at least a choice. The should creates a kind of guilt frame where you're feeling bad about something that you think you should have done because that's the way that life is. And again, in cognitive behavioral therapy, there are no shoulds except for breaking the law and hurting somebody or killing somebody or doing something wrong with someone else. Everything's negotiable. So there are no shoulds. Again, breaking the law and hurting somebody, the only shoulds that exist, everything else is completely negotiable. Um, the next one in there is personal labels, I believe. Personal labels is very easy to do with yourself and with others. Think about all the times you say to yourself, oh my God, I'm such an idiot, or I'm such a fool, or I'm such a weak person, or I should have really thought this through. See, I just threw in a should as well. Um, that means you're labeling, labeling yourself in some way. So if I'm labeling myself this way, I'm probably labeling others. If I'm labeling others, I might be labeling myself. So you want to be aware of what you call yourself. Even if you said it to yourself for years and you say, ah, it's not a big deal because I've said it, it does make a difference. So again, if I'm shooting myself or I'm saying something like never and always, and I'm also calling myself something, um, that's going to create more anxiety for myself and it's not going to quiet my mind. Another thing about labels is, is remember failure, for example, failure is an event. Failure isn't the person. So you can't say I am a failure. I'll let you say, yes, I failed at this test or I failed at something, but that's an event. It's not a person. I am not a failure myself. I get depressed sometimes, but I'm not necessarily a depressed person. So those four are really good to remember. I like the first one, the examining the evidence the best because my mind tends to wander very easily into thinking that my thoughts are true and that what I'm thinking is, you know, again, a stone cold fact, and it simply is not. So I want to just take a break there and see if anybody has any questions on that, or if Jennifer, you want to throw something in there. I went pretty quickly through these. I have more to add, but I just wanted to take a little quick break. I find myself with when you were saying like the absolute language, I try to when I notice myself using like should have or I, I could have done this. I say stop doing the shoulda, coulda, woulda kind of thing, right? Just a little thing to say in your mind to remind you to let go of that absolute language. 
That's right. And also look, and within your relationships and with your work relationships, it's the same thing. I'll give you a little challenge. The next time you have an argument with your spouse, say to your spouse, you never listen to me. <laughs> gonna be oh, like, I see what, that. Are <laughs> what, are you talking, what are you talking about? Because maybe they, they don't listen to you very often, but there might have been one or two times or five times or 10 times that they did listen to you. And immediately you have an argument. Immediately you have an argument. So the absolute language doesn't work in any sort of area of your life, but particularly with other people. Or you always do that. You always do that. That's not necessarily true. Most of the time, it's not true. Most of the time, it's simply something that we use without thinking because we are upset or we're really angry and we really want to make a point. We want to stress something. But the should and the shouldn't, whether you should or shouldn't, um, to me, are, are the most damaging. So you kind of have to be like your own sort of language detective. You know, try to um, change the dictionary of your language. And you can do that by, by paying attention to how you are thinking about this day. Yes. It's great. And Stephen said, I know these, but apparently I totally forgot them. I feel the exact same way. <laughs> like It is so nice to have the reminders um, of these tactic or these techniques and that are so simple but we can so easily overlook them and then also jada said so far today she's full of anxiety because she has so many things to get done but this helps remind her to take a step back so good timing i agree jada i feel the same way i've been like oddly anxious this week about things and i do have to step back and say like just be nice for a minute <laughs> yeah, i have that like full body feeling right now where i'm just like freaking out but try to stay calm yeah. <laughs> one thing at a time and Aaron you had your yeah. hand up oh sorry am I am I muted no. no okay so I was thinking so I think that the examining the evidence is interesting because I feel like you know I have been spoken to not by my current co-workers but I have been spoken to angrily by a co-worker and it does send me reeling a little bit and so I'm just trying to imagine, like it is upsetting to be spoken to angrily. That is something that does cause immediate anxiety. And I, but I find it hard to shake. And I wonder, I guess it's because I run it, I start running a dialogue in my head mm -hmm. and it must be that I make, I'm drawing conclusions about them being a not exactly. so nice person. And, but I also probably think about the judgment that they're making, which is just a maybe a judgment that I fear most in myself, you know, that led to the angry snip, you know, I'm just trying to imagine right. what that, you're right. How so I could no, rework that. So nobody likes being scolded. You're absolutely right. Or told that maybe you could have done a better job or something like that. However, the aftermath is what you have control over. So am I going to see that as a fact? Yes. I just got yelled at, but am I also going to make an interpretation about myself based on that fact? based yeah. on scolding. That's the difference. Now, a lot of us grew up in homes where maybe we were criticized a lot and maybe we were encouraged to be ourselves and to be authentic. And so we get triggered easily, but that's something that we can work on too, because you know now I'm 58, I'm not 15. So I have the choice as to how I'm gonna interpret that. And I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna try at least, I'm gonna choose to not interpret that as an opinion and just see it as a fact. And you're right, that person may have issues, they may having a bad, maybe having a bad day, but that does not necessarily mean it's me. Again, I am not, I may fail sometimes, but I am not a failure. That's an opinion about me. I have to say too, John, about your comment with like, with age comes the wisdom, you know, we practice these things. We have a bunch of our young people on with Hira and Jada and Adriana and, you know, Liz, you know, and the, the, I'm so proud of them for doing this at such a young age. And I wish I could have learned this back when I was a teenager. It's so valuable to be able to practice starting so young. So kudos Absolutely. to you guys. If I, if I, I feel that if I had done this work 30 years ago, I'd probably be <laughs> a calmer, better person, but I'll take it for now. But yeah, I had the language for that when I was growing up in the eighties, this kind of conversation uh, was non-existent and um, and I don't even know that I would have had the wherewithal I might have been too shy or too embarrassed or feeling too inferior to put myself out there and to attend a workshop like this or to try to make myself better so kudos to all the younger people um, that are listening on this good for you
Well, and John, you and Aaron both hit on the inner dialogue um, aspects. Is there, do you have any like quick tips on, because I am a master at the inner dialogue and creating something that does not exist. <laughs> Right. Do you have any like quick tips to like get yourself out of that mindset when you know well, you're doing it? The cue is always anxiety. So whenever you feel anxious about something, it doesn't come from anywhere. It comes from something. It's something that you are thinking in probably in a distorted way and something that you feel threatened by. So if you can pull back, if your cue can be anxiety and pull back and think about the things we talked about the first week, but mainly these this week, and just again, play detective and just take five minutes, to pull back and examine what style of thinking am I using right now, that will really help to reduce the anxiety because it'll ground you in much more of a realistic way of seeing things. When you're floating in all these, the absolute language, um, when you're using double standards, as Eckhart Tolle says, you're in the play of thought. You're not really in the moment because you're worried about the future or you're beating yourself up about something in the past. So it's all the play of thought. So when I ground myself in these, I slowly start to change my inner dialogue from it being a reflexive one and maybe a negative one to maybe being a calmer one. My inner dialogue is really what rules my day. I, I don't always have the power to have a great day, but I have the power to have a fairly good day if I'm very aware of my inner dialogue. I'm not perfect. So true. And we did have a question from Kira. Um, she said she's trying to be 100% fully present in the workshop right now. How can one be more present and focused when there are so many obligations to fulfill? Well, that's why I always say this, dial this inner dialogue check-in works whether you're in COVID pandemic or not. Every single day could be stressful. Anything can be stressful. Even being idle and not working and being home alone is stressful. So we're talking about structure, having things to do, pacing yourself, being kind to yourself. Um, so I, I don't see it any different each day um, to have that kind of structure and that kind of, you know, mental protocol for yourself than you would any other time. School too, school, work, everything is going to bring up some kind of um, pressure. Uh, here in Los Angeles, when, we, when people are out on the freeways, we worry about how long it's going to take us to get somewhere because of the freeways. So what I try to do is I try to say, whatever the condition of the freeway is going to be, I'm going to have a good drive. I'm going to listen to my... Spotify, I'm going to call a friend, but if I think, oh my God, I'm going to get on the freeway, it's going to be awful, I'm going to be late, then I'm already setting up my day poorly. So in advance, I'm saying whatever the condition of the freeway is, so in translation, whatever the condition of today is going to be, whatever comes my way, if I'm, if I'm grounded in all of these concepts, I'm going to have an okay day. The freeway is not going to bother me no matter how congested it is. I like to, um, Jean said, she likes to say to herself, be here now. And mantras are, can be so powerful in adjusting the inner critic. I, what do you think about that, John? I love mantras. Um, I might've said this last week, but my two favorite words are for now. So for now, I feel terrible. For now, the COVID pandemic is really making me anxious. But again, as Eckhart Tolle says, that's it. That's all it is, is for now. You don't know what's going to happen in an hour or in a day. So for now is good when you are feeling, I think I did say this last week, for now is good when you're feeling awful because you may not feel awful in five minutes. And for now is also good when you're feeling great because you may have some doubts in five minutes. So you're just staying as flexible and as fluid as possible and not so invested in always feeling good. If you're always invested in feeling great, it's not going to get you through the day as best as if you are prepared for something that's going to come your way. I hope that made sense. That's awesome. Well, we're at time with yes. the workshop. So awesome job staying right on time. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we have the recording. So Jane, I know you hopped on a little late. Don't worry, we're gonna get the recording to everybody. So thank you so much, John, for your advice, your guidance. Um, and thank you everybody for coming and we will hope to see you next week at noon same time and yes all the recordings we're gonna get you a follow-up email Erin sends those out she'll send you all three of the first workshops and then the link to register for next week so all thank right. you all thank you take care have a great weekend and we'll see you next week bye-bye bye guys